uh, you've come to, we've saved the best till last. Uh, so thank you for, for staying with us. But we've got a great session where we're going to be looking at uh, different issues of what we've discussed over the two days. Uh, we've got a couple of great speakers for looking at it from a supply chain perspective and how IT will or does impact their worlds uh, and a couple of companies and associations who will giving us, be giving us their perspectives uh, again on, on similar on the, the development of IT and technology in the automotive industry. So uh, from the supply chain perspective, we're going to have discussions rather than presentations uh, with Toyota and Magna, uh, and there'll be presentations uh, from, uh, from IQMS and the Institute of Process Excellence. But first of all, we're, uh, before we start, I just again a reminder about the evaluation forms. Uh, the evaluation forms are on the table now, but I guess if it's a, an IT-led uh, discussion, whether it's supply chain or automotive IT, we've been talking about IT, so if you prefer to use the app, you can give us your feedback on the conference on the app. It is very important to us. We do take the, uh, the evaluation, the, the forms and the feedback very seriously. It's a rel uh, as a joint event, it's a brand new event, so any suggestions, advice uh, that you can give us, it's your event, help us to give you the, the event that you want and that you deserve. But the first speaker of this afternoon uh, is someone who I've known for a number of years. Uh, I think it was from, probably, I wouldn't be surprised if it's 15 or, 15 or so years, so we must have both been at kindergarten at the time. Uh, it's a good friend of ours, Tony Mignon, who's the Senior Manager of Strategic Resources for Toyota. So, uh, t uh, Tony, we're not doing kind of, you know, in this instance, a long, you know, presentation or something, but if you can give us just some opening thoughts on automotive logistics and IT. Okay. So the first question in your mind, what is strategic resources? Yeah. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Um, it's a really great title, but you heard in the last <laughs> session, I am that liaison between business and IT. So I convert IT language to business, business language to IT. I'm actually on the business side. Things that I'll talk about is service parts and accessories, that side of the business. We had other people here from manufacturing and, and other groups. That I think Toyota Connected was here too, a different group. Um, a little bit on the background, why I was uh, chosen for this role. I've been with the company for 29 years, yeah. I was in everything but uh, the Lexus division. So I, I've done vehicle logistics, parts logistics, manufacturing logistics, um, quality. I was even in the legal department back in 2009. You could do the math and figure that one out. Um, yeah, not a fun time. <laughs> so anyway, so I actually, I'm going to be a contrarian here. I'm going to actually throw some ideas and different questions out, out there. No presentation, no death by PowerPoint here. Um, throw some ideas. We could talk about them a little bit more. Um, earlier yesterday morning, we heard a lot about systems. You need to throw systems at your uh, operations. The things to think about is you need to keep your customer in mind. Always keep your customer in mind. Does this add value to your customer? If it doesn't, rethink what you're doing. Second thing, along those same lines, is what problem is this trying to solve? A lot of times we go for that shiny object and we're trying to put flash to our operations but if it's not solving a problem, you need to rethink that. Um, you, another idea is, you know, Steve Jobs and in his infinite wisdom was always saying that you need to think about the customer, but you need to put ideas and you need to put products out there that the customer doesn't even know that they want yet, but you offer it. Those are some solutions that IT can offer. But along those same lines, you need to think about what you're good at. What's your core competencies? Does this IT system support those core competencies? And what I mean by that is uh, we had one of the speakers, I think it was yesterday, saying that when you bring these new systems in, you need to change your process. That may be true, but you can't give up your core competencies. You can't give up what you are good at. And the reason I'm saying that is, of course, you know, as you heard, I'm from Toyota. We've got a, a nice Toyota production system, lean. When we look at systems, we're not willing to give up those principles. 
We're not going to give up Lean just in time. We're not going to give up Kaizen, um, JKK, Hoshin Connery, all those things that go along with it. We're not going to give it up just to have a shiny new system. When I say a shiny new system, the newest system that I'm operating that we have on our side right now is 1996. <laughs> yes, it's that old. Um, we're bolting on new things, new ideas. We're doing enhancements to this system all the time, but it supports our core competency of sell one, buy one. It's efficient, it works, it has great uptime. Um, those are the things that you really need to look at. Um, back to what you're good at, uh, think of competitive advantages too. What do you consider as your company's competitive advantage? And when you're looking at a system, does it support that? Does it support what you're gonna do, where you wanna go, where your vision is? Does it support your customer? And does it also solve a problem that you have within your operations? Believe me, I love IT. I love everything electronic. Um, I'll just say it. So in the men's room here right now, they actually have soap dispensers and water that are infrared. And I see guys shaking their heads. Three of the four water faucets are not working right now. <laughs> and two of the soap dispensers are not working. Key point here is you need 100% uptime. If you're going to go for those shiny new objects, you better make sure they work and that you implement them. Um, one last story, and I'll, we'll go to Q&A. Many years ago, we were looking at a transportation management system for the service parts. And yes, we do not have one. And I remember I was interviewing the guy from Hershey. Yeah, they make a little bit of chocolate. <laughs> they were implementing a TMS system. And unfortunately, it went long, it went bad, and it wasn't ready to go for Valentine's Day. Yeah, <laughs> this guy isn't working for Hershey's anymore. <laughs> but those are the things to think about. Think long, think hard about the implementation. How is it going to fit into your system? How are you going to be able to work with it? And plan the heck out of it. Okay. Thank you very much, Tony. And it's good, you know, one of the reasons we invited you up was for that contrarian view, because maybe we've heard a lot over the, the last two days about how IT is the answer to everything. But, uh, but I've heard this a lot from Toyota in particular, and from some others, that it's about solving, finding a pain point and fixing it as opposed to just being the, the solution. Uh, and I can give you examples of, of how that's been the wrong way around in the past. There was a and it was about 15 years ago, the head, of, the head of global logistics for a major car maker, he was new in his job, uh, but because of whatever contacts I had there, I went and saw him in the first week in his job. Asked him, you know, you've been given this great role, what is your, what is your objective, what have they tasked you with? And he said, the management in their infinite wisdom have bought uh, a great new system, I won't name the company, uh, a great new system, and I have to work out what it does and how I can use it. You know, it should be the other way round, surely. Uh, but also regarding TPS, as you mentioned before, and again, you know, you you can prove me wrong if if that's the case. But I think a lot of people try to copy Toyota production system, and I think nearly every company, <coughs> excuse me, has got a whatever it is production system, some kind of PS at the end of their name. But I, I understood from the Toyota guys that one of the mistakes they all made when trying to copy Toyota was to make it more complicated. They kind of thought, if we can take the Toyota production system and automate it and made it, make it you know, some kind of IT system, then we'd, we'd, be, you know, we'd have a hyper, uh, to, you know, an Uber to TPS system. But Toyota told me it was the simplicity that made it work. So uh, am I right on that? Is that what makes Toyota, the TPS system work in those days? And perhaps that's how people never quite got it right after that as they tried to automate it. Yeah, it, the Toyota production system is still about people. Mm -hmm. People, it's about the process, repeatable, standard operating processes, uh, what we call a shikumi, which is like a dance step, that you're gonna walk from point A to B to C to D and then back around again. You've got to make things repeatable, predictable, reliable. 
At that point, once you have it standardized, then you can Kaizen and you can make it faster, better, cheaper. Um, I talked a little bit earlier you know, about our system being from 1996. We are looking at cobots and chatbots and RPS um, or RPA. However, it's not going to be the core. Our people are still the core of our business. Uh, we're still going to be using a person to pick the part. They may put it onto a cobot that's going to deliver it to the uh, loading dock. That's going to save the walking time, but the the systems support the people, not the people supporting the systems. It's a very different way of thinking. Okay. Um, and again, this is a, a Q and A. Not it's not a like a fireside chat with me and Tony. If anyone's got any comments, questions, agreeing or disagreeing, then by all means uh, chip in uh, uh, any time you like. But I want to go back on your job title, senior manager of strategic resources. What comes under strategic resources? Because that's the big issue. It's, it's all right having, you know, there's talent issues, there's IT issues, uh, and one of the things is how do you make how do you make sure that what you're trying to achieve is a strategic resource, so that th it can be progressed within the organisation. Okay. So in the current role, I have the IT enhancements. So we are looking at making our system better. These are small enhancements that are usually less than about a hundred thousand dollars. Um, we're also looking at the break fixes, so the uptime. So when we see our system running slow, if they do an overnight batch and it crashes, I have a group that has responsibility for that. So keeping the system live and, and keeping it vibrant all the time. Um, I also have another group that we do things like the annual planning, the mid-range planning process, the Hosh and Connery. We're working on a lot of those different, those are more of the strategic type things that we then support the division in the direction that they're going to be going. Um, the key role that I do is that liaison with IT. So IT, I think it was the last session he was talking about, does, does IT take it to you or do you take it to IT? And I think he hit the nail on the head. The answer is yes, it's both. So they're going to be bringing ideas to us and then we'll bounce them against operations or we'll be able to put it through a filter and say, does this make sense? Does this solve a problem? Is this something that our customer will want? And the same thing is, like coming here to this conference, I'm going to be learning different things that I could take back to IT and said, have you looked at this? Here's an idea. And then be able to get a, what we call an OOM, an order of magnitude. How much is that going to cost? You know, the ROI, we need to get ROIs in about a year. So before we invest a lot of money, we need to make sure that it is a benefit, it is going to take care of something, it's going to save money. It's all about making the operation better, leaner, faster. Mm -hmm. And Toyota's brought everybody together in Plano. Does that, does that mean you can share ideas? Do you meet others more regularly whereas before there was Kentucky and, and then, uh, then in California and Torrance and so on? Yeah, great question. So I'll give you a long story short. Um, we used to have a North American headquarters in Torrance, California, over by the LAX airport since 1958. Import-export company, sales and marketing. Then in 1996, we launched the manufacturing group in Erlanger, Kentucky, over by the CVG Cincinnati airport. They did the manufacturing. We operated as two independent silos. Last year, we built a centralized headquarters in Plano, Texas. So basically, the two groups, we all merged into Plano, Texas, integrated all the different groups. So, you know, Doug Adams was up here yesterday. I never met the guy until I got to Plano. I'm now having regular uh, discussions with LC and their type of operations. We're all merged, one big campus, um, sales, marketing, logistics design, engineering, there's still a group up in Michigan that's doing the true design of the vehicles. Um, there's also some engineers in Kentucky, but the core of the company now is, I'd like to say under one roof, but it's under seven roofs <laughs> in a brand new campus. Again, I'd like to offer the opportunity, strange, we've got, got such a big room, and you've made sure that you've taken advantage of every kind of, every corner of the room is covered. But again, if, you, if you've got any questions or comments or anything, uh, please feel free to, to chip in at any time. Just make sure anyone's hiding behind the, the podium. Um, and just what advice would you give to a, either a logistics service provider or an IT or a tech company who want to work with Toyota? What, should they come in with a flashy presentation? Should they keep it simple? Should it be numbers? 
But how, how should they approach? If you want to work with Toyota, this is the approach you should take. I'll give you a very biased opinion, my opinion. Don't come in with flash, because um, if it doesn't work, it, that's really going to be a big problem. And we know technology is great, but it does have sometimes doesn't work. You can come in with a paper presentation. You need to show value. You need to show unique ideas. Um, we believe in long-term commitments with our suppliers and our partners, so we're not going to just drop someone if it's a nickel cheaper per mile. Um, you have to show value. Come up with ideas. We will coach you in the long run. We'll mentor you. If you want to learn Kaizen or get better at it, we'll help you with it. Um, we're looking for long-term partners. You know, we had partners 30, 40, 50 years. That's not uncommon, just like we have associates that have stayed with the company for 50 years. Um, we're looking for the long run. So again, come in, be patient. It's not going to happen overnight. And I, I think I get from your presentation, I'm, and I've heard from others uh, in, in more private conversations when I've visited other car makers, they're not looking for IT solutions. They're looking for solutions. They're, they're looking for uh, trying to fix a pain point. So I think that comes across with what you're saying. You, you don't care if it's IT. It, it could be anything. You're looking for solutions. If it happens to be an IT solution, then great, you'll consider it and look at it. But it doesn't, you're not looking for IT, you're not looking for IT solutions, you're looking for solutions. Is that a fair? It, yeah, and like I said in the opening, what problem mm. is it trying to solve? Yeah. Now, you know, don't throw IT at it, mm. look for the best solution. Now, mm. if IT happens to fit, mm. great. If you've got a low cost solution and an IT solution, Try the low cost one first, trial it. If it works, then you can eventually do the IT. You could do it in steps, but don't go, we don't like to go for the flash. Um, a lot of times that's not very successful. The Big Bang Theory, in more cases than not, you know, ends up in extended overruns, cost overruns, time overruns, and upset customers. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, any questions? Not for now. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. We've reached our time there, Tony. So thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, thank you. Thanks. And I'd like to, uh, the next uh, presentation, I'd like to welcome to the podium Louis Columbus, the principal from IQMS. Hi, Louis. Hi. Good afternoon. Thank Good you for afternoon. having me. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you for... Uh, coming today, and uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to share with you uh, how IT and supply chain systems could work together with one another mm -hmm. to be able to become collaborators in creation of value and exceed the customer expectations that really dictate the roadmap of this industry. So IT and supply chain, we talked earlier today, uh, of how important it is to be collaborators in creation. And one of the more important aspects of that is how you manage product configurations down to the shop floor level. From the shop floor to the top floor, there has to be a revolution around customer value, as opposed to internal metrics and overall focus on that. So there's this aspect of that called configuration lifecycle management. And if you take anything away from my presentation today, I want you to realize that there is a revolution going on out there with customers today, and that the old ways of building product and having IT and supply chain deal with each other at arm's length, it opens up an opportunity for a brand new disruptive competitor, an Amazon automotive, automotive manufacturing, the likes of which no one has ever seen before, is sitting latent in those customer expectations waiting to come up and basically unearth this industry. So yes, on Amazon, you could do assembled to order of a car. Yes, you could get a truck any color you want on there. Yes, it'll generate a lead to the sales team. Yes, there's multi-channel there. But the ability to build a car on an Amazon-like site, go multi-channel, and have it delivered in 72 to 48 hours, there's great books on this. That is what people expect. Thank you, Facebook. Thank you, Amazon. Thank you, social media. But what's going on is expectations are so high now that that is coming. And so it is up, it's incumbent on every manufacturer to start thinking in speed of the customer. What's the customer expect? Where, how can these systems come together? And it's coming faster than I think a lot of companies realize. And so where does this all fall down? It's in the product configuration. 
because in the configuration, the configuration has to be seen as a model. It is an entity. It is a standalone independent entity in the best companies. So you look at Amazon and you say, the marriage of IT and supply chain has made them collaborators in tremendous value. They're $1,500 a share this morning. So it's amazing. And no government will slow down what the market requires. So that is, that's a train and that's moving. So how did they do that? Distributed order management. And, and what they did was is they looked at these same aspects that are driving CLM today, which are they were very customer focused. Uh, I don't know if you caught the story of Jeff Bezos. Uh, he was irate that it took four minutes to get a customer response over Christmas. Uh, the, his VPs of uh, customer service were all over the place, were in this meeting, and they said, yes, Jeff, we solved the problem. He called into customer service in that meeting on the Starfish. It took four minutes, and then he slammed the Starfish down, and he said, that's just not good enough. And that was pretty much, and a, and a year later, that VP was gone. So, <laughs> so that customer orientation cannot be understated. So metrics to the shop floor is absolutely critical. And whether you choose to emulate them or not, that level of intensity around customer improvement is here. And it's real. And it's happening. And why do you think there's $3,700 put on every car to sell it? Because there's a compensation going on there for getting to the heart of what a customer really wants. And so when you look at all these different factors together, you have the data, of course, the cloud in terms of being, it's now a commodity, data science, the ability to crunch data to be able to see what's going on, and these are a whole host of other factors. But then when you start to look forward, what are the challenges to this? You know, great speaker on the first day, legacy systems are dinosaurs. The ability to make a dinosaur be able to coordinate and get in the game of being able to integrate with CAD, CLM, PR, PR, PLM, and then be also with ERP, being able to eke out the last remaining drops of value from these legacy systems, and then being able to make all these systems concert with one another, be able to make them all orchestrate and work towards the customer. That's where the value is. So I think when people look at legacy systems, of course, they're the bane of the existence of a lot of industries, and there is fragmented, tangential, decreasing value in those systems. However, I really want to challenge you to think about every one of those systems is moving at a different cadence. And there needs to be an overarching system or strategy that compensates on all those different system cadences to be able to excel for the customer. And that's what managing configurations as a life cycle makes happen. And so when you look at that, knowledge now becomes the differentiator. And on that panel earlier today, we talked about where knowledge and the pursuit of knowledge is now cutthroat. Being able to hire the best people and get the best knowledge is where, it's, where things are winning today. So, you know, it's irregardless whether you chase uh, the lowest labor hour around the world. I mean, you could do that, and that's very 90s. But if you chase the smartest people around the world, and you get the smartest people in the world you possibly can, and go to where the smart people are, and get that contextual knowledge that gives you that competitive edge of being able to deliver superior customer experiences in conjunction with IT and supply chain, that is where I think companies are picking up more and more market share. So, you know, part of the uh, conference has talked about IT. No conference of IT is uh, complete without mentioning the word platform. So this is my platform slide. So, um, <laughs> but I can tell you that from my experiences at IQMS, my former experiences as an industry analyst, that when you build a platform that scales, that scales with APIs, that scales out and allows for modularity and the ability to flex for a customer's needs, those platforms are defining the disruption and the revolution that customers want. So, Quite frankly, don't kid yourself, there are companies out there that have the potential to be the Amazons of the auto industry and completely disrupt the value chain. That may be coming. There is room for that. However, every manufacturer needs to start thinking about an open architecture, about how do they capitalize on APIs, how they up their game in terms of technology, and then also think about the customer. Think about what can a IT system do to serve these customers? So you have CEOs, VPs of channel, VPs of marketing, and VPs of cloud architecture. And 
the whole discussion of cloud, whether it's, uh, you know, whether you have cloud religion or not, you know, the good news is cloud is one. Cloud is now de facto across many, many companies because of the speed to market, because of the ability to customize it, for the ability to be more responsive to customers and be able to accelerate time to market. <clears throat> but IT systems need to see themselves as the servant of the customer. And everybody is selling. Everybody is, every day in a manufacturer, looking at how do you make that customer experience excellent. And, and the best plants that you walk through, and it's fascinating to go visit manufacturing plants around the world, because what you see in the best plants is you talk to the people on the shop floor, you talk to the manufacturing engineers, you talk to the manufacturing managers. And you know what? Everybody has a clear line of sight of who the customer is. You know, where's this engine going? I asked an electrical engineer in a Siemens manufacturing plant in Norwood, Ohio. He said, that is going <clears throat> to this plant for Deutsche Telekom in this area in Germany, and this is what our quality metrics are, and this is why it matters what I'm doing. And so that customer ownership down to the shop floor is invaluable, and that's what systems can do. Systems can create a different culture, and it's really up to IT and supply chain to work together because realize one fundamental aspect. The metrics you choose today will be the culture you have tomorrow. So the metrics you choose today will define what kind of a manufacturer you are tomorrow. If you're choosing OEE and you're looking at it on a per manufacturer, per machine basis and you're trying to roll it up against the plant, yeah, that works and then you can't compensate for different suppliers and OEE is a fine metric. It needs to be balanced with responsiveness, time to market, time to customer. But what you see in the best run companies right now, in the best run manufacturers, they scale, they simplify, they monetize, they're able to go ahead and take customer requirements and get back to that intensity of entrepreneurship, of building a car for a customer and delivering it with a lot of intention. I mean, in other words, there's a lot of focus on how to excel on behalf of the customer by being able to look at product configuration more as a module, as a standalone element than just broken apart. There's quote to order, you know, I just did a recent survey of 2,500 manufacturers uh, at IQMS, and number one, help me improve my quoting accuracy and quoting speed. However, the ability to hand off that quote into ERP with a, with a clear bill of materials and drive towards a perfect order and beat the deadline to a customer and delight them is what everybody's fascinated with right now in discrete manufacturing in the mid-tier of the market, which was the respondent based in the survey. So how do you do that? Well, this is a module or a, a framework that I put together because I sincerely believe that the next Amazon of automotive, whether they ever break the surface or not, but there is the potential for that to happen, will have the ability to real-time integrate PLM, CAD, ERP, and CRM systems and they will get into this virtuous cycle of overwhelming customers with value. They will get into this virtual kind of cycle or cadence of being able to hit time to market on new products, being able to excel for time to customers. They'll deliver customer requested cars exactly the way a customer wanted. Customer satisfaction scores, NPS scores, any metric, they'll go through the roof because they've learned how to make that cadence and how to make all these diverse systems, even the dinosaur systems, with marginally decreasing value of data, how to make those all orchestrated across a common goal of excelling for a customer, treating configuration as a common overall goal. So when you look at that, it completely changes your mind because everyone looks at these systems as standalone, and everyone looks at it as, I mean, I've been a product manager over half my career. I mean, you look at, Everything in a, in a gate process, I've managed roadmaps before. It's very convenient in product management to look at, you move through these stages and your team is responsible for getting these products defined and built in conjunction with engineering, and then you hand it off to marketing and they do the future product introduction. But that world is changing rapidly because the need for speed and the need to be able to redefine relationships, because even with your dealers, even with your indirect and direct channels. Those relationships are, are changing, and those people want a revolution. Those people want greater responsiveness. You can't always assume that they will be the way they've always been. So 
That's really a critical aspect of moving further and further towards a configuration vision. And then finally, one thing I've really seen come out of working with manufacturers is they've adopted cloud. And IQMS, we are on premise. We have hosted managed services in cloud. But our, our most advanced customers right now are pushing us for APIs. And this ability to move from reacting with pure data, and the point was made earlier today on this panel, don't tell me a dashboard. Tell me real-time data. And the way that that's going to happen more and more is open APIs and having people who can look at APIs and say, yeah, that's going to give me context into this customer. Toyota consolidating operations in Texas is a prime example of they're all about scaling this and moving up from collaboration into orchestrating demand. Toyota production system, world renowned. Uh, you know, the onboarding process to be in the Toyota production system in Japan, it takes a year to be, to be even qualified to participate there. Those suppliers practice supply chain collaboration, and one of them said that data that we share is more valuable than money. So data then becomes the value to these suppliers as they all try to pass uh, the overall rigorous standards of Toyota. So data becomes the new money. Data is the currency of these suppliers who are struggling to meet these requirements. And then what this means in terms of IT, IT no longer has to build applications by the, ca paid, the cadence and the speed of legacy systems. Because now you're free to be able to build with intelligent APIs, there's entirely new development environments. You could actually excel at building things that all orientate, again, to the central goal of IT, supply chain, collaborators, and creation, and tremendous experiences for customers. And what does that mean in terms of contextual intelligence? It becomes now a system of record. It gives you a fighting chance against any disruptive force like an Amazon in the auto industry, which personally I find absolutely a fascinating thought because someone somewhere is going to come up with a blockchain or a order management service, a distributed order management web service, maybe on blockchain, but that has that ability to be able to aggregate data and be that responsive and be absolutely market responsive and take, take market responsiveness to an entirely new level. And so with that kind of data, at least you have a fighting chance because now you're, you're in this reciprocal relationship with customers. Now you're in this responsiveness. Now you're not seen as being not listening to them. Now you don't have to throw $3,700 on a vehicle to try to move it because now customer demand is so high. And so finally, what is the bottom line? Is the bottom line is the future for growth for manufacturing is all about excelling on these dimensions of product configuration from the shop floor to the top floor, of excelling, really working hard to be able to reorientate IT systems not from the benefit of your contracts with SAP or Oracle, not from the benefit of the financial implications, but more about what's the benefit to the customer. And so this is a roadmap to value that really explains where product configuration and configuration lifecycle management as a construct of orchestrating all these legacy systems together to excel at meeting and exceeding customer commitments fits. So I think that's the only path of growth for this industry, quite frankly, is that it needs to embrace this customer-centric view of IT. IT and supply chain need to put down their shields and work together and be collaborators in great value for customers. So with that, that's my presentation. So uh, I'm exactly at zero <laughs> time. So uh, are there any questions? Or? a little bit just to keep it fresh. Yeah. Uh, I'm the North American version. Yeah, North American. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes. North American Louis, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so it sounds like uh, we, we may not have to watch the dinosaurs go extinct just yet. or more about herding dinosaurs, I suppose, right, on exactly. this. Yeah. So can you give us a little sense of, and you don't have to name brands per se, but uh, who's, who's kind of ahead in the game here? Or is the automotive industry on this path or compared to other industries? Or is there anybody, maybe besides Amazon, who, who particularly you would point to as, uh, as, as, as further along? Yeah, I use Amazon because it amplifies the contrast. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it, by no means are they uh, fault free. Yeah. You know, they have their own issues. But uh, I, I look at uh, you know, what's happening in the different services industries. There's a lot of this kind of orientation. Uh, towards building out a, a configuration.
configuration lifecycle management oriented approach. I think that uh, the, the high and storage business uh, and uh, parts of the high tech business have done this extremely well. High tech is one of the early adopters of artificial intelligence, mm. uh, specifically in the foundry aspects of their value chain. Mm. Uh, but high tech is, you know, it's, it, they, those, are, uh, those are companies run by nerds. I mean, these people <laughs> live and, you know, absolutely immerse themselves in data, so they move in this direction. Mm. Uh, but the customer centricity is driven by insights from how to manage configurations. I think you can see that more and more in aerospace and defense, uh, because that's such an ETO-centric environment. By ETO, I mean over 70% of a product will be defined by the customer. Mm. They've had no choice but to triangulate customer requirements to compliance to costs. And in that triad, uh, trying to navigate that is extremely difficult without reorienting every system around how to excel at ETO and the customer requirement. Mm. Mm. I mean, we typically, in, in the US, we've, we've heard it said a few times, uh, obviously the customer typically buys us off the lot, right? I mean, it's, it's, in Europe, maybe you have more built-to-order models. But do you, do you see the opportunity for the automotive industry to, 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 to move to a change here, to actually offer the, offer the customer the quick response and exactly what they want so that they don't just have to you know, rely on what's, what's on the shop floor? I think people make compromises. Mm. You know, I, I, think that, I, I think so. I, I think that there's more and more of this orientation towards customization. Uh, social media has certainly taught people that. Uh, and uh, Nike is certainly teaching people that in the area of shoes. I and mean, there's a whole, you know, there's a myriad of companies mm. that practice ma mass customization and build to order. But I think that if you're going to be able to hit the preferential point with a customer, given the option, I think that they would order exactly what they wanted. Mm. Mm. Uh, and that, you know, Cyan was an example of that, uh, and others. And of course, you know, with. Uh, with the uh, Mini Cooper, there's 800,000 variations that you can order of that run by an SAP variant configurator. Mm. Uh, and so that is to an extreme. But you know, there's, it's the aspect, is it a utilitarian vehicle or is it a vehicle of fun? Right. You know, the demographics around a, BM, uh, a Beamer or a, a uh, Mini Cooper, you know, the demographics are, you know, people are north of 140, 150K, it's a mm. weekend car, they want to make a statement. Uh, and so they're looking to accessorize, yeah, you yeah. know, whereas I think the more utilitarian aspect of a student out of school, you know, is just thankful to get a, you know, maybe a low end used Camry or, a, you know, a new Corolla or something like that. Mm, mm, absolutely. Um, again, th th we are open for, for questions if there's anyone um, who, who would like to chime in at any point um, before we move to, to another speaker soon. Um, Obviously, we're talking about the need to move to open architectures, yeah. and, and this come up a, a few times, but I mean, does, uh, in terms of then obviously managing security and cybersecurity, which, yeah. which comes in. So what, what, how does that fit into, into, into the cycle you're, you're yeah, discussing Yeah, it's absolutely here? critical. Yeah. Um, and, the, and the saying is, if you haven't been hacked yet, you don't yeah. know. Yeah. Uh, you know, you go look at the Verizon uh, DBIR report. Uh, that's eye-opening. Uh, and I don't recall exactly. I just wrote about it for Forbes. Uh, the DBIR report is very insightful. The aspect of zero trust security, though, mm -hmm. is I think the future of, of this type of security model, especially for automotive, because zero trust security has the ability to flex for endpoints in a network. And so zero trust security will use machine learning to take every endpoint. As you grow your business, it will take every endpoint and it will assign a risk score to the device, to the OS, to the person logging in, and it looks for pattern matching. So for example, in a zero trust network, if you're at a dealer, or let's say you're working at Toyota, and you're gonna log into your laptop here, this is atypical for anybody from Toyota to be logging in from you know, this hotel at this time. Uh, and it's gonna go through a, uh, you know, it's gonna go through a multi-factor authentication, it's gonna look at machine learning, uh, using machine learning algorithms to interpolate that that's exactly who you are. So I think zero trust security has tremendous potential in automotive, certainly showing a lot of strength uh, across the services interest, industries, companies like Centrify, mm. uh, Palo Alto Networks, uh, even, uh, even Citrix. I was at a Citrix conference a couple of weeks ago and they've obliquely moved into zero trust security for the secure desktop mm. and that's securing every endpoint uh, on every network and being able to do authentication and not brute forcing people into getting authentication requirements every time. 
Fantastic. Well, and there's, there's so much more we can talk about here, but, um, but obviously we have a couple of other speakers as well. So unless there's any last questions for North American, Louis. <laughs> Louis, thank you very much. Thank that was you. a really fascinating insight. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, pleasure. Thank you, sir. And with that, I'd actually like to bring British Louis back up because we're going to go have another discussion on stage. So British Louis, the floor is yours again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, a very interesting presentation there. And again, covered both sides of supply chain and IT. And now, for again, more for a, a, a discussion rather than a presentation, I'd like to welcome to the, uh, to the stage here Adam Pienjezek, the Senior Manager of Logistics North America for Magna Powertrain. Thank you, Adam. So Adam, we, we heard a little bit from, uh, from Toyota that uh, IT isn't necessarily the future. And, uh, and there is, you know, there's a lot of common sense in there about it being about, you know, solutions rather than IT. Are you a big, uh, how do you see the automotive logistics industry developing? Do you see IT as an important part of the development or do you see that's just a bit of an add-on to what we're already trying to do? I think uh, IT is... Uh part of it. I think the more we think about the end customer, the suppliers, the 3PLs, how they're all interacting with one another, they have to be working in a coordinated effort mm -hmm. um, and really in alignment in order to achieve the vision. I think the bigger question is, what is the vision? <laughs> and I think we all have different ideas of, of what the vision is. I think it depends on how far you're looking out. Mm -hmm. When we talk about my organization, which is Magna Powertrain, and my sphere of influence, which is 15 uh, plants in North America, we look at it more, probably more and more as strategic partners up and down the supply chain, uh, as well as uh, third-party providers that can help us achieve world-class capabilities mm -hmm. and execution. The, the funny part about being part of corporate is we often talk about the ideas. We often get hung up on what's the idea, what's the new direction, and my role in the last six years as part of corporate has been much more about working at the individual plant level and working with our 3PL providers in order to find greater efficiency within the network. You can argue that it's nothing more than trying to save money. Mm -hmm. That's part of it. Okay. Um, but ultimately, it's about doing better systems and, and processes that achieve the end result that we're after. It's often about what is it that we're, we're after. I, I think about the auto industry a lot, and right now we're under tremendous change. We're right at the cusp of talking about is it providing a vehicle or a package, or is it going towards a service, which is I want to get from point A to point B, efficiently, safely, economically, is where we're headed. Many of us drive in big cities, and when I look at my fellow commuters, we're all single commuters in a vehicle. <laughs> and it takes tremendous resources in order to build the infrastructure to move us from point A to point B. The question becomes, why don't we use other means, whether it's public transportation, um, et cetera. Normally it's because it feels like it's an inconvenience. As things are, as we reduce the cost of things and we learn to adapt to simple ways of ordering things. I think about Uber and I think about the taxi. I was having a conversation with uh, someone earlier today uh, who's from New York City, and I said, to hail a cab, you just went to the sidewalk, threw your arm up, and, and some vehicle would stop and pick you up. 
And I really think that the taxis kind of miss the idea of what people are after. Mm -hmm. They want the convenience and are willing to pay for it, but it needs to be on their time. Mm -hmm. And if they adapted you know, applications in order to do that, if they made it easier to pay, I guarantee you they wouldn't be a dinosaur in the industry. They may be leading the charge. So now it becomes a question of where are we going? It comes back to that vision question, where are we going? So I'm gonna talk about supply chain. Mm -hmm. We talk about it more as visual management. We want the capabilities to see everything, but ultimately we don't wanna be overburdened with too much data because as humans, we like to group data into smaller packets. Mm -hmm. We like to look for trends, but generally at the plant level, at the user level, I want to know what's going to bite me today. Mm -hmm. So I want to know all the trucks that are behind, all the delays, so that I can focus my energy on resolving those issues. So it's not unusual in the day to day. We spend 80% or more of our time focusing on a very small percentage that are going to impact production. We know production is king when we talk to our facilities. They are most interested in not shutting down the assembly line and God forbid, shutting down the end customer. Mm -hmm. The idea of doing supply chain well, it's important, but it's not as important as the impact of shutting down the production and ultimately the end customer. Mm -hmm. So my role is someone that gets to think about logistics 24-7. I have the luxury of time to ask the what if questions. I have the ability to say, where do I think the market is going and can I position my organization to take advantage of that? Do I bet on any single technology or view? No, I try to look at and have conversations with people out in the marketplace to say, what is out there? What are we doing? whether it's in the automotive industry, whether it's outside the automotive industry. Retail is really about that individual customer. Mm -hmm. You know, when we really think about it, when, when I think about my customer, I'm not at the retail level, I tend to be more at the OEM level. So it's more of a bulk purchase. Mm -hmm. So my, my viewpoint is always about who is doing things that are really cutting edge what can I learn? Can I implement that within my supply chain? And how does it make me better? How does it help my customer? It is about solutions. It, it is kind of a two-step. We like the ideas, but ideas are about 5% of the real work. <laughs> it's about implementing and making sure that it works. And that's really the value. When I, when I look at technology and I think about systems, if it is something that's repeatable, whether it's on an assembly line or in the office environment, I'm sure I can develop and work with a software developer to find a solution that can automate that process, take out a lot of the day-to-day -day things. Mm -hmm. When I think about the subject of problem solving, I can teach people, I can teach a computer that one plus one equals two, and they can learn this all day long. It's very repeatable, it's very easy to do that. When we talk about facing real problems, that's where the human element comes in, and it has to use everything, I refer to it as, you have to use every fiber of your being to find that unique solution to the problem that you've never faced before. You may have to rely on outside parties. You may have to expand who you're looking for. Oftentimes when we talk about solutions, an individual comes about two thirds of the way, but if he can share that idea with four or five various individuals, they'll get closer to 90 or 95%. Mm -hmm. And that's part of that collaborative effort. Very few of us ever accomplish anything on our own. We rely on others to help. We borrow, sometimes steal great ideas wherever they may come. We try to make sure that we may have to modify them to work within our cultural environment. When we talk about 
Toyota and their production management system. It's not a a la carte. You have to buy the whole thing. Mm -hmm. It is really a cultural mindset. One of the mistakes that people do is they try to pick and choose parts mm -hmm. of it that they think will work, and then they're surprised that it doesn't. Well, they've got about 60 or 70 years of using this process, and they're getting better at it every day. So if you start today, you've got a big learning curve to go. So for us, when we talk about technology, we normally hear three big things in the auto industry. Autonomous vehicles, we hear about big data, mm -hmm. and we hear about electrification. Mm -hmm. Those are the big things we keep hearing about for the automotive industry. Being on the tier one side, electrification to us takes two forms. One is the vehicle, whether it's a passenger vehicle or maybe a big rig truck, some, something along those lines. But it's also at the component level. Mm -hmm. We're seeing that there's more and more desire to uh, move away from mechanical systems to drive a lot of the automobile. Mm -hmm. And it creates great opportunity to get more efficient, get more flexible in design. It allows an opportunity to reduce the weight. Those are some of the challenges. Mm -hmm. um, when we talk about autonomous vehicles, it kind of falls into two categories. One is, um, we'll call it the personal vehicle, and then the other would be more of a class A, big rig, uh, moving product. If, if we think, where it's going to go, more than likely, it's gonna start on major highways. There's less, less variables to deal with. When we talk about city traffic, you have jaywalkers, you have people walking their dogs. I see that this morning near the hotel. You have buses and taxis and individual cars, people trying to cut in. It's much more challenging to program a vehicle to, uh, to do that. If you go on I-85, there's normally an exit about every three miles. It makes it a little bit easier. If we think about distribution centers, it may turn into these distribution centers are very close to these major highways that allow us on and off ramp to that so that we're not, um, so that we allow ourselves to kind of go into this 24-7 um, moving of, of products and goods. So it's, it's all possible, it's, it's just about time and, and how quickly we adapt to that technology. Mm -hmm. Okay, and which technologies are you most excited about to support logistics and supply chains? Blockchain, AI, AR, what? I think the one that we often talk about is having all the systems talk to one another so that we don't have to have one universal platform. We just need the ability for them to share and communicate effectively with one another. What I think that it's heading is, you know, there's certain key data points that everyone uses. It just becomes a question of which system are you using and how do you input that data? We're going to see a time very, very soon where we're going to be doing less and less data entry and we're gonna use the same data from the same source and it's gonna input into our systems and it's gonna run through the process. Mm -hmm. So the dream of eventually may transpire. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily any one system, but I think it's that integration of all the systems working together and talking with one another that's going to hopefully lead to a better society. <laughs> okay. And again, as, as we keep saying, it is, a, you know, it is an open forum, so please feel free to, to ask a question, apart from that guy. Apart from him, anybody else? <laughs> your name uh, and your company name, please, sir. I work for the Automotive Conference. Um, <laughs> it feels like it sometimes. First off, I would like to, to really congratulate uh, your uh, MVT because you have been doing a great job in, in nailing some of the most important uh, questions without a lot of um, generic ideas. I think you, you have been nailing it to the point. Um, being a first year, my question to you is how do we ensure that that communication with your second and first years 
are also in line ensuring that that terrible incident that God forbids, which is stopping the, the OAM, will not happen. How you control that, how you plan on your organization as a first tier to ensure that reliability? Great question. Um, one of the, the challenges is to understand that your suppliers are, in essence, an extension to the end result. Oftentimes, we view it as more or less who gets the bigger share of the profit. And we try to beat on everyone to figure out how we can get a little bit more of that cheese for ourselves. When we recognize that we rarely do anything of pure success on our own, we realize that the tier two and threes help us to achieve our goal. So when we stress the idea of we want to be world class to our OEMs, to our end customers, we have to set the same uh, vision for our suppliers and make sure they understand they're part of that success. They have a role, they have a place, and we want them to share their knowledge and experience to help us get better to ultimately provide better products to our end customers. That's really, in a perfect world, what happens. We strive for it, sometimes we achieve it, sometimes we don't. Normally, it's, a, it's, it's more of a mindset. I think when we, we talk about where we want to go with the supply chain, at the end of the day, it, it's creating that mindset that we're in it together and we'll succeed or fail together. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, I think we'll leave it there All right. uh, then, Adam. Thank you very much. And as I said, you, you kind of explained everything in your, in your uh, summary. So thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you, Adam. Thank you. And next up, uh, I'd like to welcome to the podium Joseph Anderson from the Institute of Process, or for Process Excellence. Thank you, thank you very much, Joseph. allowing uh, Tony to go prior to me, because as Tony introduced himself as a contrarian, um, I'm kind of that on Wheaties, right? So they're having a process excellence disciple close out their conference. So that, that <laughs> speaks something about them, and I think it means they also understand what that means. Um, IPX has been around for a little over 30 years. We used to be known as the ICM, or the Institute of Configuration Management. Um, in 2016, when I joined, um, I challenged them. I said, what you teach and what you produce for companies is well beyond change in configuration management. I spent uh, over 20 years um, with Delphi Automotive and Rolls-Royce deploying common uh, operating standards and processes around the globe, uh, in addition uh, to PLM systems, ERP systems, and MES systems. Um, I think, hopefully, some of you out there remember the day when those acronyms actually stood for processes. PLM used to be about product lifecycle management, the process of managing your product. ERP, resource planning, right? MES. For those of you that think that stands for Microsoft Excel spreadsheets, cut it out. That's not how we manage manufacturing anymore. But what I'm here to say is you have to work hand in hand. Your systems and your processes have to work hand in hand. Thankfully, the presenters right before me have kind of given me some slow pitches. I get to be the hammer and I get to kind of knock those, those nails out, right? Well, green is four. There you go. So the first thing I'm going to do is just ask you to challenge the way you think, right? If you're here, you're looking for advice, whether it's IT, whether it's process, whether it's both. We've all been with companies that have ended up on recalls.gov. If you have products that have made it there, if you have products there that, that are there today, you have to ask yourselves, can we improve? How did we get here? Is the way we are thinking still causing us to have issues? If this IT tool, we're looking at investing millions of, millions of dollars with licenses, uh, CAD users, PLM licenses, ERP, all the portals to connect that, are we really solving our problem, right? So I challenge my staff, I challenge all of our customers, it's on the back of my business card, to always challenge and evaluate the way you think. Honestly, assess yourself. 
I know there's many of you out here today. Um, I've been involved in audits, right? We market and brand our audits. Am I getting thrown off already? So we've all been in, uh, involved with audits, right, where we train our employees with a little note card on what to say, what not to say, when to contact your manager, when the, audit, when the auditor's on, on site. That's not a true assessment, right? That's not going to give you true results. It's not going to help you improve. If at any time you find yourself in this scenario, most of you don't like to admit it, you have a process issue, right? It also means you probably have a system that's not actually truly functioning. It's not providing the capability that you need. So right now, in today's world, we have PLM systems. We have ERP. We have MES. You heard Louie um, from North America talk about CLM, right? Configuration Lifecycle Management. I happen to agree. Um, I've spent a lot of time studying uh, systems, digital technologies. And what you'll see from us, uh, from IPX, we teach what's called CM2. That's a global industry standard for change in configuration management. What's that mean in a nutshell? It gives you the roadmap for end-to-end -end traceability throughout your enterprise. CLM, from an acronym standpoint, is a means to enable, enable that traceability digitally. It also allows your systems to talk and communicate. So from front office all the way to the back office, what's that mean? We've got true consumer demand now across all products. Everywhere we're at, it's how do we take this data from, the, from all the way to the end from a service field and drive it back to product development. And that's where CLM is, right? It's connecting that front office to the back office. That for us from the process perspective is CM2. So these core business processes and their enabling systems, they represent the major organizational activities and functions used to perform, work, and conduct business. I normally don't read off of slides, but this one's important. You have to know your processes, those core competencies, those core processes. And you also have to honestly evaluate them. Those processes dictate what systems you need. They dictate the functional requirements for the capability that you want to have. It's also what your users need. You heard Tony say you always need to know what your customers need, what your customers want, what your customer requirements are. We add that. We add to that. We say, remember, your internal users are also customers of the systems and the processes you make them utilize. Right? You need to know what they need to do their job efficiently and effectively. That's a very important statement. This one is, um, I've, I've lived this uh, for over 25 years with companies that are unwilling to admit they still have issues. They do not want to admit that we still have room for improvement. They'll be quick to find a budget to go buy the next shiny thing, right? You've heard that discussed. The tool will fix the problem. That's not necessarily true. You'll sink millions of dollars into a tool with actual, without actually investing in your workforce. It's about workforce development as well. Train your workforce. Have legitimate assessments of your processes. Know what they need to do to do their job. Don't hide things under the rug. You're hearing a lot of buzzwords over the last couple years. You're hearing digital transformation, digital thread, digital twin, um, and I could list those off. Um, if we were smart in 1986, when we coined the phrase CM2, we would have called it the digital thread, because that is what the digital thread is. It's the ability to connect all your enterprise knowledge from the application side to the physical side, have full traceability anywhere within that, go into a touch point and say, I want to change this, I want to look at that, and it's going to show me all those touch points. That's the digital thread. Digital twin has very little to do with CAD. It's the ability to take that digital thread in a virtual st setting and do verification and validation, not for, just from a physical, from a regulatory requirements, from a customer requirements. That's where you're seeing true CLM companies that really get it and have the ability to do those complex algorithms. That's why you're seeing that kind of um, momentum from CLM come up. I know we have Configit here today. Um, I've done a lot of research on them. Um, Look at their VT technology. See how they actually manage that data. How do they connect systems? That's the secret sauce for CLM and connecting that front office to the back. Um, I'm not going to read from this, but we've been defining this digital thread for um, since 1986 as, as this bottom sentence. And that's, that's the core of CM2. Um, and, and this is what it's about. It is about your people. It's about your processes. It's about your systems, but also your data. right? 
you have to sometimes take those pain points and do the data cleansing, do the proper data migration. You have to rationalize your product structure. You have to rationalize your processes and the data model. You have to take that time. So future state, we've had a lot of great presentations over the last couple of days talking about what the future is. Um, you hear a lot of people talking about AI. Uh, at IPX, we don't define the A as artificial. We break it down. It's action-based, it's autonomous-based, or it's adaptive, or it could be a combination of one of the three. Action-based is the, you know, we've had AI for a long time. It's you program a, ro a, ro a robot to do a static uh, task over and over again. Autonomous, that's kind of the new, the new buzzword now, right? Autonomous vehicles. We have smart sensors. We have the capability of moving objects to drive themselves through public areas, right? Fairly safely. Adaptive's the next one. That's the one where everyone's trying to figure out how do I get in an autonomous moving object to think adaptively? That's the human element. That's the next phase. And how do I combine those? All of those have complexity and configuration control. How am I gonna manage that? What are my fail safes? Why do I, how do I have revision and change control over something that's allowed to behave adaptively, right? That's software, that's a software change. So from a service perspective, are you gonna have your consumers sign off of liability on that product, right? So if we do move to fleet vehicles, what's that mean from the insurance market? These are all things that we're involved in, but for us, the future state is having that, that the data from a siloed uh, specific entity, which many of you are in today, you still need your competencies, but we need to bring that all into one efficient operating model, one efficient business model. And again, your, your data from the process to the physical, it's all related. It has to become related. It's having dynamic data, not static dashboards, right, which we just heard earlier. Uh, the supply chain, you're hearing a lot of companies talk about the digital supply chain and how they're moving towards that. I always challenge them. Um, the proof is I look right at them and I say, how many of your suppliers are you working with from a process perspective? Are you going in and assessing the way they operate? Do they operate better than you? Do they operate worse than you? Are you doing that analysis? If the answer is no, then you have work to do. It has very little to do about connecting your system so they could talk. If your suppliers, tier ones, tier twos, tier threes, if they're inefficient or they're ineffective or they spend a lot of time in rework, you're gonna have issues, right? You're gonna take all of that and you're gonna, you're gonna put that right onto your consumers. It could be higher costs, it could be lower quality, it could be loss in brand, right? No one wants to end up on recalls.gov. So again, the people, the processes, the data, the enabling solutions, this is your digital footprint. If you're gonna lay out that roadmap, you need to know it all. Where are we headed as a company? So big data, tangible analytics, what's that mean? I love Microsoft Excel spreadsheet, but you need real dynamic data. You need to know if something was serviced in the field, what happened, what was changed, do we need to send that into product development? Real-time data, real-time analytics, it has to be functional. Don't force someone as an executive to give you a report that you don't use because you're just wasting their time and you're wasting your money. Again, AI and AR, I've touched on that. Digital capability. This is just, you need to know your, you need to know your user. You need to know your end, your end user and you need to know your internal users, right? What do we need to be the best company within our respective industry? I wanna be best in class. You hear a lot of revolutionary um, executives out there today kind of bashing the traditional models and there's nothing wrong with changing and improving, but you have to ensure that what you're doing is actually just, right? Because if we do, revolutionary things that cause us to have issues in manufacturing, how good are our upfront processes? Are we just throwing complexity downstream and hoping they catch it? If you hear of a company struggling time and time again to meet manufacturing deadlines, what's that mean? It means their upfront processes are broke. It means they're, in, they're not looking at it from an enterprise standpoint. They're very siloed, they're very functional, competency uh, focused, and they're not looking at the enterprise side. So if you see a company that's having manufacturing issues, their, their inputs are wrong, or they're not valid. So for us, a global enterprise connected core, that's where most world-class companies are headed or are. Um, and you hear a lot of, uh, again, I'm, I'm a process guy, so I'm lean certified. I'm a Six Sigma transactional black belt. I've done the agile. 
it has to be functional for your need. You take the best principles, you figure out how to apply them and make it functional, right? So for us, you have your requirements, you have the application. Whether it's regulatory, where it's customer, you have to know. You have to know what your requirements are demanding you to do. That's what quality is to us, right? Conformance to your requirements. We let most of our customers speak for ourselves. I'm not gonna read off the slides, but you're gonna see comments from Cummins. You're gonna see comments from Gulfstream. And we provide free benchmarking for all of our data, but at the end of the day, all these companies are trying to figure out how to be a large, global, connected company, right? How do we get our core connected if we've grown from acquisition, if we've been working in silos, if we're multi-branded, how can we have a connected core? And at the end of the day, you heard Tony mention it, you have to have the right operating standards. You have to have best-in-class operating standards. You have to take the time to invest in that. Success is staring all of you in the face. Um, what's it mean? It means your enterprise has the ability um, to reach limit, a limited co customer base. I challenge companies all the time within the traditional automotive sense, what's automotive, meet, what's automotive going to mean in 10 years? Right? What's transportation going to mean in 10 years? You're seeing something revolutionary come out every three years. You hear Industry 4.0, we're in the cusp of that now. You're in a future where your organization offers the largest portfolio, fastest delivery time, and greatest customer experience. This should be important. You heard Tony mention it again, customer experience. If you're gonna invest in process improvement, tool improvements, what's it gonna do when you deliver that product for your customers? Is it gonna just increase the price? Is it actually gonna improve quality? Is it something they need, right? But at the end of the day, we've gotta ask ourselves, what are we doing to make our company better, internally and externally? We work with companies all over the world. We have a global congress, um, industry agnostic, that actually we take feedback from. They submit change requests to us on our curriculum on the training side, and they also uh, provide feedback to us on our service sector. So this is aerospace, this is high tech, this is automotive, this is agriculture, this is medical. All these leaders provide feedback to us on our curriculum that we're teaching to their resources, and we discuss it. We're open, right? Maybe they have something better. Maybe they don't, maybe we work with them, but we do have a cross-industry Congress that, that's driving revolutionary things from an industry 4.0 perspective, from a digital perspective. This is true digital transformation, it's tangible. It's not just a buzzword, it's driving a commonality for the best operating model, the best processes you could have. For us, it's about preparation, transition, application. You have to take the time to prepare. You have to know your requirements. You need to know functional requirements. You need business stakeholders to sign off of those requirements. And don't ever sacrifice functionality to meet an IT drop dead date, or block date, right? How many times does functionality get sacrificed because you have to meet a date? Basically what you do in that situation is you give your users food poisoning, right? They've gone to their favorite restaurant, they've spent, they spent the money on a meal, and they got sick after they ate it. They're always gonna remember that experience. Right? It's hard to repair that after you've done it once. So when you're going up to your users, make sure you give them something that's functional that they could use. It's just a typical marketing slide, I didn't talk about it. Um, at the end of the day, um, you're here to network, which you've been doing over the last day, but you have to stay connected. Um, I speak at a lot of these events, and time and time again, you see great ideas, great thoughts, but no one takes it anywhere. You go back and you, you make the same mistakes or you start working in that siloed mentality. Share, network. Doesn't mean you have to pay for it, but there's people all over the world that's been in your situation. So with that, I've got about 25 seconds left, so wrap it up. Thank you, Joseph. I think it was another excellent presentation, and it really, again, that complemented very well some of the discussion points that we picked up, uh, picked up elsewhere or earlier in, in the session. Just a reminder, because again, in case you were scribbling notes or taking photos, we will distribute the presentation, so we will, you, you'll get these slides, we'll send them to you uh, next week. So we can sort of 
actually writing at the end of the conference here, I think it's appro very appropriate that we're closing an IT and supply chain conference on process, actually, because it, it really is the fundamental basis. And a similar question that I asked to, to, to North American Lewis earlier, um, since the IPX works across industries, um, you know, where do you see automotive in this journey right now and compared to some other sectors or companies that, that might be leading the way? Um, you know, I think automotives, honestly, it's, they're, they're in the middle. I think your, your larger OEMs, uh, some of them are, of course, uh, ahead of others, but there's, there's a catch up, right? You, you've seen over the last five to 10 years a, a huge issue from a quality perspective in automotive. And I think that's something that you know, we need to all hold ourselves accountable uh, for. Um, we should not release products that endanger the lives of anyone, regardless of what we make. And we, and we really need to focus on quality. So I, I see a big push in automotive. I see some revolutionary things that are happening with companies you haven't heard of yet um, that will be joining that automotive sector. Um, and I think they're gonna, there will be a large paradigm shift on we need to, we need to change. Mm. Right? We need to adapt to best in class um, methodologies. Mm. Where do you see some of the key areas that, I mean, you mentioned quality there. I mean, is it, is it working through the legacy issues? Is it mindset culture? What, what, what are some of the stumbling blocks? I think, it's, I think it is culture. I think it's business engagement. I think there's been a, a, a real lack of workforce development over the past 15 years. Um, and, I, and I think you're gonna see from a university standpoint, uh, curriculum changes. Mm. Um, I think we've lost the, um, the fundamental process teachings and learnings um, when I was in university. Um, I think you're gonna see a, a focus on CLM from a process perspective. And I think you're gonna see product life cycle management get back to its basics, which is we need to understand the full life cycle, the full process of a product. Mm. It's interesting when you talk about, you know, we should obviously shouldn't release products that endanger the market. Um, but there's obviously a lot of focus on the long development time and cycle, product cycle in, in automotive, especially compared to the tech industry and other, other, other sectors. Um, it, I mean, I'm not overgeneralizing here, but are we almost saying, step back a little bit from, from that need for speed to make sure you have it right, but at the same time, in the changes that we see, there is a need for speed. I think if you have the right processes, the speed, the speed is it's there. It's, mm. a, it's a tangible benefit. I think most legacy companies struggle with cycle time because their processes are poor. Mm. Um, they've built IT solutions over bad processes. Um, they didn't clean their legacy data, um, and they've just built on, on top of that, and it's just compounded the issue. So I think with product development times, product release times, uh, those are dictated by your processes. Mm. You don't have to, a good process doesn't slow down product development, it speeds it up. It also ensures you don't have rework. Um, that's one thing that's not mentioned a lot is, you know, companies with quality issues have a lot of rework, mm. you know, a lot of waste. Um, proper, proper processes ensure that doesn't happen. Mm. Mm. You mentioned universities before, but obviously we, we need to be in a continuous education Kind of style now. I mean, it, again, since we're at an automotive conference, um, you know, do we need a lot more on-job training? A lot more conditioning? I guess this is almost a softball softball to you, <laughs> to yeah. throw up, but I uh, do think it's an important issue. Yeah, absolutely, and I and I always have. Um, it's how I've made a name for myself. It's how I've moved up in my career. It's I've challenged myself um, from a from an education standpoint to always know and learn about the latest trends and technologies and process improvement initiatives the Leans, the Six Sigma, the Kaizen, um, and how to apply those to what I do. I think companies have been quick to invest in the shiny tools mm -hmm. uh, and have spent very little, if none, on workforce development. And mm -hmm. that's catching up, right? Mm -hmm. From a manufacturing all the way up to an engineering perspective. Mm -hmm. any, any last questions or comments from the audience? Uh, we have a question right in the back there. We have a mic coming right to you. General Motors. Um, this could be a little controversial, but uh, what do you think brings uh, success, uh, more success to an organization? Is it the people or the process? It's the people. Okay. It's 100% the people. You got the best processes in the world if you don't actually go out and engage with your people and ensure you have a place where people could work safely, happily, right? I mean, no one wants to go to a job endangered. Right, especially at, at a General Motors, but it is—it comes down to both. There's a balance, um, but your people—if you go in and, and you and you do an analysis of your workforce, a true one—typically where their frustrations are, it's the processes, right? 
we have to do this, we have to do that, we have a work, we have a workaround for this. Um, they're most unhappy with inefficiency. So I, you have to invest in both. Well, I mean, I, I couldn't really think of a better statement to end on there. So I think, uh, Joseph, I want to thank you for your presentation and your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, that's, and that's really a great point, I think, to end this conference. We're talking about continuous education and training there, talking about the people, because uh, it's all about the people. I think for this event, you know, we didn't, we didn't think for the IT side that it would be like an SAP user conference where you're going to sit the screens and learn things, or, or, or we're going to do a, a warehouse demonstration where you, you know, you, we show you everything about the best racking. This is more about putting people together and getting them a chance to be inspired, um, to get some new ideas to bring back. You know, um, and, and I think this is what we, we heard from, from our panelists. This is what we heard from our speakers throughout the day. I hope it's what you felt and, and gained throughout the networking and the discussions that we've been having. Um, uh, before we close, uh, a last reminder about the, the feedback forms, which, which are there, or again, you can do, do that in the app. Um, as we mentioned, certainly this is a new conference, certainly with the IT edition, the automotive IT edition, so really keen to have your feedback on, on, on what we can do better, uh, what you liked, what you didn't like. Um, and, and likewise, on the supply chain, I think, I, I think it was enhanced by, by bringing everything together in that way, but we, again, we, we, we want to hear from you, so please do that. And please keep in touch with us. Um, if those of you don't receive either automotive logistics or automotive IT, um, you know, we're very happy to sign you up. Uh, obviously, you can read it all online. Uh, we, have, we have apps, we have digital versions, we have news feeds. Um, so, so please do connect with us, because uh, we, we're very pleased to be connected with you. And that goes, again, if someone in logistics who wants to get the IT, we're very happy to, to set that up for you. Um, again, most of our team um, is, is here. Hopefully, you've met throughout the day, whether it's Arian Bonga, the editor of Automotive IT International, or Joanne Perry, the editor of Automotive Logistics, or North America, no, sorry, British Louis, <laughs> uh, Louis Yakumi, uh, who's been hosting so much of the supply chain, so, and, and me, is, of course, as well. So um, we're, we're really pleased that you came and you spent uh, the days with us. It's been a great conference. Uh, thanks again to all of our participants. Thanks again to our sponsors, and mostly thanks to you. And we hope to see you again in another one of our events. Um, we have them around the world in logistics. We're we'll happy to give you more information on that. There you can, you can see why it is um, my, my girlfriend sort of tends to forget what I look like because we have to go to all these events. Um, um, but, but obviously, we're doing lots of other content, interviews, stories, other kinds of research. So please uh, be in touch. And there's a, lot, there's a lot more that we can share. So thanks again to everybody, and we'll see you soon.